I'm Amy Goodman. America's Hitler, reprehensible, cultural heroine, noxious, a terrible candidate. That's how Ohio Senator J.D. Vance once described Donald Trump. But on Monday, Trump tapped the 39-year-old to be his running mate, capping an extraordinary rise for Vance, who was just elected to the Senate in 2022. J.D. Vance first gained fame as the author of the best-selling memoir, Hillbilly Elegy, a memoir of a family and culture in crisis about growing up in Appalachia. The book was also made into a movie. Vance is a graduate of Yale Law School who served in the Marines and became a venture capitalist. He won a close Republican Senate primary in 2022, in part thanks to billionaire tech investor Peter Thiel, who spent a record-breaking $10 million to support Vance's campaign. After years of criticizing Trump, Vance shifted his views to embrace the MAGA movement. In a major profile, political reporter Ian Ward describes this shift by writing, quote, Vance has completed a dramatic evolution from outspoken never-Trumper to unwavering Trump loyalist and dogged defender of the ex-president's most authoritarian assertions, from the lie that the 2020 election was stolen to the legally dubious claim the president is immune from cl criminal prosecution, unquote. On Monday, President Biden criticized Vance as a, quote, clone of Trump on the issues. We begin today's show hearing J.D. Vance in his own words describing Donald Trump. In 2016, he appeared on NPR's Fresh Air. I'm going to vote third party because I can't stomach Trump. I think that he's noxious and is leading the white working class to a very dark place. In another 2016 media appearance, J.D. Vance spoke to MSNBC about sexual abuse allegations against Donald Trump. Well, this is sort of a he said, she said, right? And at the end of the day, do you believe Donald Trump, who always tells the truth? Just kidding. Or do you believe that woman on that tape? No. To talk more about J.D. Vance, we're joined now from Pikeville, Kentucky, by Arlie Russell Hochschild, sociologist and author. Her forthcoming book is titled Stolen Pride, Law, Shame, and the Rise of the Right. It's a follow-up to her 2016 bestseller, Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning on the American Right. The book was a finalist for the National Book Award and has been described as a Rosetta Stone for understanding the rise of Donald Trump. Arlie Hochschild, thanks so much for being with us. If you can start off by uh, just responding to the news yesterday that Donald Trump had chosen J.D. Vance uh, to be um, his vice presidential running mate. Uh, you have been on a panel when both your books were out, Hillbilly Elegy and Strangers in Their Own Land. Talk about the rise of J.D. Vance, what he means, and what President Trump means. You know, thank you, Amy, um, for the invitation. Um, you know, I'm here in Pikeville. That is a 40-minute drive to uh, Jackson, uh, Kentucky, where Vance spent uh, his summers, uh, mainly with uh, his uh, mama, who, who really brought him up when his uh, mother succumbed to drugs. So he's, there's that story, personal story, uh, that I think uh, that Trump picked him to represent. But for me, um, the real question is, you know, there's a saying, uh, which is, um, without wood, there would be no fire, from Proverbs. And so, what's the support for Vance? The support? Why do 40 percent of Americans, um, you know, think this is the way to go? I think what we need to do is to back up and look at the larger 
story of um, red state, blue state differences. I think here in Pikeville and in this area, and this area is the whitest and second poorest congressional district in the country. Um, it's Kentucky Five. And it's used to be uh, at the center politically and uh, in the 90s, uh, you know, two thirds of this area were blue dog Democrats, but they voted 80% for Trump in the last two elections. So what's happened to Vance as a person sort of happened to this region and not just this region. It used to be on the left and it's gone right. And so what's the wood that's leading the fire? What What's the reason for this? I think um, that's what my book's about, and that's what I think we who are alarmed at this trend uh, need to look at. Talk about your work and what you found over these years. We last spoke in 2016. Uh, you'd spent five years with some of Donald Trump's biggest supporters uh, researching your book. Um, and talk about how things have changed from leading into the first uh, presidency of Donald Trump to what's happening today. And also, Arlie Russell Hochschild, how people have responded to the horror of the assassination attempt on Trump on Saturday in Pennsylvania. Well, the people that I'm talking to here, uh, it only uh, consolidates their uh, uh, sympathy for Trump and their determination to support him. And that's because they see him as a supporter of them. Um, so uh, to answer your question, what makes this uh, current book, Stolen Pride, uh, <clears throat> kind of different from my previous book, uh, Strangers in Their Own Land, is that I'm focusing actually on this issue of democracy, what people feel about it, and, uh, and why do they feel so strongly. And, you know, there's a regional story, and that's that coal jobs are out. They have blamed uh, the, the liberal war on coal for that loss. Opiate addiction has come in big time and hasn't stopped um, in this region. Mainly poor whites are the victims of it. <clears throat> and uh, these are in under-regulated states, uh, I should say, uh, Kentucky and Tennessee and uh, West Virginia um, let these opiates come in. And they've done untold damage. Uh, so these are people who have just felt down, just a sense of terrible loss, freefall loss. And now um, many are leaving the region, the young, the most educated. And so this becomes an area of loss. And I think it speaks to a lot of the red states. And they don't feel the government has uh, offered answers with dignity. Uh, to them for this loss. So in a way, I see what Vance's story is kind of a regional story. And I think the regional story kind of speaks to a larger story. In a way, we're used to thinking of countries like uh, Mexico and the Philippines or Kerala, India, as kind of sending uh, 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 people out to richer uh, countries. So there's the metropole that has many jobs and kind of rich. Uh, and there are poor states that migrate to them. Well, there's a domestic version of that. Kentucky is the Mexico of a domestic system like that. It's sending its um, uh, it's young and it's educated out. And that's a tremendous loss for them. And once uh, a person from Kentucky goes, uh, you know, to San Francisco or New York, they feel labeled as a hillbilly. 
Um, one guy told me that even going to Lexington, just hours away, but it's a city, when they hear your accent, oh, and, and you're in a store and looking at things, they begin to follow you around because they think you don't have the money to buy what you want to buy. So there's a kind of a label and a shame. Uh, and that's the, uh, the next story I would tell, that it's not just this logic of economic caps and have-nots. There's an emotional logic that goes along with it of shame and pride. Uh, here in Kentucky, here in Appalachia, very proud people, very gifted people, uh, but who've suffered this big loss. They're shaming themselves, especially after addiction, kind of uh, breaks up many families, and does irreparable harm. Um, they shame themselves, and then they feel like people in the blue states are just uh, slinging epithets at them. They feel shamed. And I think Donald Trump comes in as the shame president. He comes in with an anti-shaming ritual uh, that relieves them of this. And I think that's a lot of the steam uh, behind um, the MAGA uh, enthusiasts uh, for the Republican Arlie, ticket. Arlie, I want to go to the trailer of the next Flix film, Hillbilly Elegy, based on J.D. Vance's bestseller, Hillbilly Elegy, a memoir of a family and culture in crisis about growing up in Appalachia. Oh, I thought your mama was going to be all right. <laughs> be happy. I know I could have done better. But you, you got to decide. You want to be somebody or not? I've been doing real good. I just had a down month. I got an interview tomorrow, Mom. Otherwise, I... Oh, you know me. I always land on my feet. Come on, come on. Don't you look at me. You look at me. You look at me. You let her get away with this every time. I told you that I would do better. You always say that. You're lying. I always try. You got to think about these kids. What do you think I've been thinking about since I was 18 years old, huh? Never had a life where I wasn't thinking about the kids. Do you actually want to be dead, Mom? Or are you just too lazy to try? Jenny, oh, I Jenny. tried. Plenty. Always got a reason. It's always someone else's fault. Some point, you're gonna have to take responsibility, or someone else what? is gonna have to step in. Who? Ha? Huh? Who? You? Hasta la vista, baby. <laughs> How many times you've seen this? Oh, about a hundred. Everyone in this world is one of three kinds: good Terminator, a bad Terminator, and neutral. You're a good Terminator. Well, it wasn't always. I had to learn. You could do it. I love you. I promise that I'm gonna do better. You, you got a right to your own life. Don't make us your excuse, JD. Family's the only thing that means a god name. You learn it. So that's the trailer for the film Hillbilly Elegy, which is based on J.D. Vance's book, Hillbilly Elegy. Um, and wondering, uh, Arlie Russell Hochschild, if you can talk about the significance of this book. Your book came out about the same time. It's how you came to know J.D. Vance, again, who then became senator uh, from Ohio and is now um, the youngest uh, vice presidential candidate at the age of 39. Talk about Hillbilly Elegy. You know, I think it's a brilliant film, by the way, of Amy Adams and Glenna Close. I think it's brilliant acting and a very poignant story. It got panned by a lot of critics. Um, but I think it tells a real story, a story I have heard here, uh, uh, up close and personal and kind of 
kind of the disruption of uh, addiction and the chaos it creates, the anxieties, the sense of uh, shame uh, that you um, are bad, and, uh, and all of that, I think, is very real, and uh, it's a good depiction of it. What this celebrates, of course, what's lifted out uh, by the Republican Party is the Horatio Alger rise, you know, personal determination, hard work will uh, <clears throat> lift you from these circumstances for something better. And it doesn't look at what else uh, we have to change so that a lot of people have uh, a chance at that. So it's kind of uh, both very poignant, but it's been politically used to pluck out a quite individualist oriented theme. And it says nothing about really uh, why people get into the fix they've been in, which is what my book is about. And Arlie Russell Hochschild, um, the fact that J.D. Vance has called President Trump America's Hitler, um, uh, talked about um, in the years past, back in 2016, really his horror um, about what Donald Trump represented, saying um, he goes after the people he, J.D. Vance's, loves, like um, immigrants, talking about Muslims. What about this complete turnaround? Yeah, and it is paradoxical uh, that people in uh, <laughs> these, uh, like in Kentucky and elsewhere, that are, in fact, the migrants, two uh, economic powerhouse centers are trying to bar other immigrants, you know, from Mexico or South America from coming in because they've actually, in the domestic world, experienced the immigrant experience, you know? And um, so that's, that's the paradox. But I think what... And I don't know what little switch turned in J.D. Vance's mind to turn him from anti-Trump to pro-Trump. It's easy to say it's self-interest. But I do think that there's something that progressives aren't seeing that is told by a story I learned. There was um, a, uh, in a recovery center. There was a man who had, uh, was a coal miner. He got injured. He went to the doctor, was given Oxycontin for pain management. He got addicted to an, uh, Oxycontin, and that led to uh, other drugs. He became an addict. He lost his family. His wife left him. He lost custody of his children. He became homeless. And that man watched Donald Trump come uh, to Kentucky, and Donald Trump was pumping his fist and saying, uh, I'm going to bring back coal. I'm going to bring back coal. And that man said, I knew Trump was lying. He wasn't going to bring back coal. But I felt he saw who I was. I wanted to so play for you Teamsters yeah. President Sean O'Brien, uh, Arlie. Uh, who gave the final speech, and this was extremely significant for the president of this major union to be speaking at the Republican National Convention. He spoke last night and the first night. Never forget, American workers own this nation. We are not renters. We are not tenants. But the corporate elite treat us like squatters, and that is a crime. We've got to fix it. Now, this will shock you. This will shock you. To paraphrase Senator Mark Wayne Mullen, it's time for both sides of Congress to stand their butts up. We need trade policies that put American workers first. It needs to be easier for companies
to remain in America. We need legal protections that make it safer for workers to get a contract. We must stop corporations from abandoning local communities to inflate their bottom line. We need meaningful bankruptcy reform. Today, corporate vultures buy up companies like Yellow Freight with the intent of driving them into bankruptcy and feasting on their remains. The courts leave workers begging for crumbs as third-tier creditors. Labor law must be reformed. Americans vote for a union but can never get a union contract. Companies fire workers who try to join unions and hide behind toothless laws that are meant to protect working people but are manipulated to benefit corporations. This is economic terrorism at its best. An individual cannot withstand such an assault. A fired worker cannot afford corporate delays, and these greedy employers know it. There are no consequences for the company, only the worker. We need corporate welfare reform. Under our current system, massive companies like Amazon, Uber, Lyft, and Walmart take zero responsibilities for the workers they employ. These companies offer no real health insurance, no retirement benefits, no paid leave, relying on underfunded public assistance. And who foots the bill? The individual taxpayer. The biggest recipients of welfare in this country are corporations, and this is real corruption. We must put workers first. So that's Teamsters President Sean O'Brien addressing not the Democratic convention, known as the Party of Labor, but the Republican convention, the first time yeah. a Teamsters president has addressed the RNC, as he talks about economic terrorism and corporate predators. Um, as we wrap up, uh, Arlie Russell Hochschild, if you could comment on this and also his wife, Usha Vance, uh, they met at Yale Law School. She clerked for both Chief Justice Roberts and uh, Justice Kavanaugh. Yeah. So, uh, listening uh, to Sean O'Brien's talk, uh, it's, it makes you wonder why those words aren't coming out of the mouth of Joe Biden and why the Build Back Better and the infrastructure bills that are really helping red states more than blue aren't paired with a kind of empathic, powerful message uh, to the very people that O'Brien is addressing. So there's a, a giant a kind of disconnect between uh, what I think the left liberal side believes what it, um, who it wants to help, and the message, uh, the message. So we have a lot of work to do in uh, the short number of weeks we have left before this election, and uh, it has to be to straighten that out and to reach out to, to those who uh, need to know that um, there's an alternative to, to Donald Trump. Arlie Russell Hochschild, sociologist and writer, author of the 2016 bestseller Strangers in Their Own Land, Anger and Mourning on the American Right, her forthcoming book Stolen Pride, Lost Shame and the Rise of the Right, speaking to us from Pikeville, Kentucky.